Guys, all yours. Hello, everybody. Good morning. We are Ilya and Alex from SciCode. And in the next 45 minutes, we will uh, present our uh, research on GitHub Actions internals, including how we discovered and disclosed critical vulnerabilities in popular uh, open source projects that were using those actions. So on the agenda, we will talk about what are GitHub Actions and why it's such a powerful build system, which kind of misconfiguration it can have, we will understand the consequences by exploring its internals, and we will speak about possible mitigations. So my name is Ilya. Uh, I previously worked as a developer and R&D team lead on the IPS product in Checkpoint. I later on moved uh, to Fireglass, a security startup uh, which uh, created the first uh, web isolation uh, solution. And currently, I'm working as a back-end technology lead at Psycho. And I'm Alex Ilgaev. I'm a senior security researcher at SciCode. Uh, previously, I was investigating malware at uh, Checkpoint Research. I reverse engineered some interesting pieces of malware, both uh, crimeware and uh, APTs. And at uh, the moment, I'm uh, searching vulnerabilities and researching mitigations for the software supply chain uh, security. That's it. OK, so you all know GitHub. Uh, and its uh, code storing capabilities. And in 2018, they stepped up their game and decided to create a CI CD platform called GitHub Actions, uh, which allowed its developers to automate their development workflows. Uh, it really became very popular uh, quite fast, and uh, mainly due to its rich marketplace. Uh, and currently, it holds more than 2,000 uh, public actions on its marketplace. Uh, and also uh, provides free, uh, free CI CD for public repositories. According to the, the, their numbers, GitHub currently has more than 73 million developers and uh, stores more than 200 million repositories. So what are the possible usage of GitHub Actions? The main usage is CI CD, as I mentioned. Um, for example, uh, running um, uh, uh, tests on open pull requests or static analysis. Uh, you can uh, build your code into containers and upload them to a chosen registry, such as Docker Hub or ECR. You can schedule tasks that will scan vulnerabilities in your code. You can use it to automatically label issues and pull requests. You can send issues to ticket handling systems and much, much more. So here's an example of a GitHub action. Uh, as you can see, it is just a YAML file that contains uh, when and what to run. So in the, you can see the on uh, keyword, which means that this action should run upon every push, every uh, new push to the um, to repository. And it contains a single job in a single step just to print hello world. To create this workflow, you simply need to put this code inside .github slash workflows, and that's it. Every next push will trigger that workflow. So let's speak a, about a little bit about how it works. So GitHub Runner is an open source project that what it, it connects to the GitHub Action Service, fetches the jobs, and then executes them. It can run on a GitHub hosted machine, which is the popular use case, and you can also run it on your self-hosted environment. The GitHub hosted runners will run as ephemeral environments, which means they're created upon a workflow triggering and will be destroyed after it ends. And for each workflow, a new temporary GitHub token is created for the possible API interactions. So bef before we talk about uh, the GitHub token itself, a few words about access tokens in general. So in order to access and modify uh, GitHub assets, you need to provide an authentication token that details your permissions. So as you can see here, when creating a token, a developer can choose which permission the token will have, which are basically a subset of the user's permissions uh, inside that specific token. So I, as a user, can have access to many organizations and many repositories, and uh, this, uh, this token will basically uh, provide those permissions when I use them. Uh, another thing you can see that these tokens can be created uh, uh, with, with or without exp uh, expiration, which makes them a lot more strong. 
meaning that these tokens have uh, a privilege to do a lot of damage and it, it can even not expire at all. So GitHub, when they designed their GitHub actions, they really wanted that developers would not use those per personal access tokens inside their workflows. So to overcome this, they created something called GitHub token. And the GitHub token is provided for every workflow uh, that uh, starts running. Its default permissions are read and write for most of the events. And the permissions are only for the repository in which the GitHub action is currently running. The token is valid during its action, the action execution period, or 24, 24 hours at most. And it uses a default parameter in many actions. And this, this is the preferred method to invoke GitHub API uh, functionalities. An important note are forked pull requests, which, ba which are basically used when uh, uh, contributors want to contribute to some open source project. They fork the repository and create a pull request with the suggested changes. And if you think about it, if that specific repository has a GitHub workflow, which for example runs a CI CD test or static analysis, this, uh, the developer can basically use that GitHub token with the right permissions to modify the content of the repository by committing via API or stuff like that. So GitHub has different uh, mitigations for forked pull requests, but the basic one is in those scenarios, the GitHub token receives at most read permissions, uh, so these scenarios won't be possible. Another core mechanism in GitHub are the secrets. So any meaningful uh, CI CD uh, workflow will need to use some secrets, for example, AWS uh, access tokens or, or passwords for registries. And uh, GitHub uh, gives us the option to store secrets. They save it in a well-encrypted manner. And if the workflow wants to use them, it decrypts and adds it to the, uh, to the payload of the workflow. There are several options on how to create secrets. Some of them are on an uh, organization scope, on a repository scope, or even a repository environment, which we will we'll talk about a bit later. And here's uh, the first example of a vulnerable action. So the sample workflow, you can see that the uh, keyword is on issue created, on opened. This means that this workflow will run every time I will open an issue in GitHub for a GitHub repository. You can see that it has a single step which runs a script. And an important note here are the curly braces that are used throughout this script, which allows uh, developers to use dynamic parameters in their workflows. So GitHub provides parameters on the event triggered, for example, the issue title and the issue URL, and also the GitHub token that we discussed previously. And this specific workflow basically checks if the title contains the word bug, and if so, it performs an API call and adds a new label of type bug to that issue. So this looks innocent enough, but let's see how it can be exploited. On the right, you can see an issue title that we provided for that workflow. And on the left, you can see what happens when it is actually executed. This title is planted inside the curly braces that we saw before. And you see here that the if statement is, uh, is uh, non-existent. It, it jumps over the, uh, the if and then uh, runs uh, code on the runner itself. This example just prints psycode to the screen. And uh, uh, the fact that this uh, crafted issue uh, uh, knows how the workflow looks and it knows how to start the if and how to finish the if in, in a way that the syntax is, uh, is valid and the workflow runs. So is it a bug or a feature? According to GitHub's best practice papers, it is well known and they cite when creating workflows, you should always consider whether your code might execute untrusted input from attackers which is very nice and very friendly, uh, but I'm not sure that all developers in the world start by reading the best practice documents before they start using the platform itself. So we wanted to know how, how popular uh, the usage of these patterns are. We used a tool called GitHub Search, and which is uh, currently in beta, but it's a very nice tool. You can just add keywords to the search here and it will search all public repositories in GitHub and will return the results. 
you can sign up and try it out. It's really fast and really nice. And you see that we search for the GitHub event issue in curly braces and also uh, um, the keyword run. As you see, we have uh, two hits here uh, in which uh, we find workflows that indeed can be exploited in the way I just showed. So is it widespread? We saw, uh, we found many, many uh, uh, popular open source projects such as LiquidBase, uh, which is a, a tool for uh, um, handling uh, sch database schema changes, Wire, which is an uh, open uh, communication uh, platform, and many more. And uh, we can see that according to the downloads of those open source projects and the, their usage, these vulnerabilities are, are potentially affecting millions of users. So here, let's dive a bit into one of the use cases of the wire specific one. And uh, here you can see a part of their workflow. You can see that it is triggered up upon any issue comment. Uh, an important note here is that um, an issue comment is used when you add a comment to an issue and also when you add a comment to a pull request. So GitHub uh, uh, use, are using the same event for both of these uh, scenarios. And you can see several steps. The first step is basically checking that the GitHub, uh, that the comment body contains some keywords, uh, Zenkins review. So if we add a pull request comment with the words Zenkins review, we will go pass, we will pass this if, we go to the next one, and here it just checks that uh, whether the comment is on a pull request or not. So if it is, we continue to the next if. Here it checks whether the title starts with some keyword and ends with some keyword, and if it doesn't, you can see the two echo commands, and the second one is basically printing out the issue title for debug purposes, and this is exactly what can be used to exploit this uh, very popular workflow. On the right, you can see that after we disclosed this issue to Wire, they were very fast in patching the problem, and it was very simple. You simply need to use an environment variable. So you see the end uh, at, the, at the top, you're storing the issue title in that environment variable, and then you can just use that, and it is already escaped, and the code will not run when you use it in this format. So what are the consequences of a build compromise? Uh, you can expose secrets, as we mentioned, um, the, in order to create a meaningful CI-CD uh, pipeline, you are probably using secrets. So in this way, once we, are, we have code that is running on the runner, we can use it to expose the secrets uh, to the sensitive assets. We can also use the GitHub token, the one we discussed before, to commit to the repository. As I mentioned, by default, you have read-write permissions to that repository. So we can create a workflow and inject code that uses GitHub API with that token to commit code that is not really part of the pull request inside that repository. Uh, in such a way, an attacker can really create critical supply chain incidents without being really reviewed or approved uh, in that manner. And a much smaller risk would be the malicious actor's ability to run botnets or crypto miners using runner infrastructure. So in this point, I will uh, allow Alex to dive a little bit deeper to the uh, vulnerabilities and the mitigations. So, so thank you very much, Ilya. Uh, let's dive a bit uh, deeper, uh, technically deeper. So Ilya explained what could be the, the consequences of such build compromise, and uh, we'll soon explore how an attacker could actually reach these consequences uh, from a technical uh, perspective. So for that, we created this intentional vulnerable workflow, which we'll explore through our uh, example. So this workflow first uh, will be triggered whenever a new issue is created. It uh, defines a new environment variable for demonstration purposes, soon we'll see while we're doing that. And it has uh, three steps. Oops. No, it, ha it has three steps. The first one, uh, doing checkout. This is an external action. It's using the checkout command, which basically does git clone to the code into the uh, runner environment. 
very simple. And it has two additional uh, run commands. The first one just prints uh, the issue title and description. And the second one is run, uh, runs a CURL to the GitHub API to update uh, this issue uh, label with a new issue. So as uh, Ilya showed previously, this echo is susceptible to injection attack because they are not sanitizing the, the, the title and the body. So an attacker, a malicious attacker, could potentially run uh, his code at this point, exact, at this exact point. So what could he be fetching in this, uh, in this sample? He could get, on the one side, could take this, this GitHub token and use it for his uh, malicious purposes, or he could get this additional bot token, which uh, comes uh, later in the strong command, and see how he, how he does that. First, uh, in order to, uh, uh, to ease the testing of this uh, runner infrastructure, instead of creating workflows and testing each workflow when it runs, we created an, uh, some lab environment in which we uh, made a reverse shell from the runner environment to our personal computer. To, for that, we used a popular tool called Ngrok, which does basically a, a TCP or HTTP tunneling, even if you're behind firewall or not. So it's really a really cool tool. We just uh, uh, run Ngrok. With the, we installed the tool on our computer. We run Ngrok TCP 10,000. TCP is the mode. It could be run in HTTP also. And 10,000 is the port in which we want to, to listen. After running it, we receive from Android, Android Cloud, we receive this endpoint, which will use it later in their exploitation. Uh, then we just create a simple uh, a netcat uh, listener on port 10,000. And at the end, we created this simple uh, bash script which uh, does the, the reversal. It's, you could uh, find the script easily in, in Google. So combining it all together, when we were sending this uh, issue title, this uh, looks quite complex, but we explained how it really uh, combined. When we, when we send this to the GitHub repository, and we, voila, we get our reverse shell. We have a control on our computer on to the runner uh, infrastructure, so we can explore it and find it any interesting stuff in there. So uh, we won't overload you with all the reconnaissance we did on that machine. Uh, you are welcome to check our full blog uh, for that. But we found some interesting uh, pieces of data which we'll use uh, later as we, as we will show in these in slides. So let's go back to our previous uh, example. So first, a very, very simple thing an attacker could do if, if we have a code execution capability is to print environment variable this simple command and find for some uh, interesting uh, stuff in the, in the environment variable. For example, we have this GitHub token defined as an environment variable, which the attacker could uh, just print the variable and, and get it and use it. Very simple. It also happens in real-world scenarios, not in only our, uh, our sample. Uh, a second scenario that the attacker could do is uh, use the checkout command. As I said, this command just does a git clone to the, to the code, but it also sends a default parameter, uh, which we are not seeing here, but it sends the GitHub token as a default parameter to the external checkout. Uh, this GitHub token is also used and as, a, as an authorization token for the git clone. So whoever were using uh, git, uh, the git tooling, also knows that whenever you're doing git clone with some token, it also saves that token in a dot git slash config file. So because we are running as an attacker after that checkout was made, we can access this dot git slash config file, uh, find the authorization line in that file, and just pipe it through base64 decoding, and we get our GitHub token. Which, uh, were used, which were sent to that action and used to, uh, to clone the code. So as an attacker, we have another uh, method to, to fetch this uh, sensitive token. This was the second scenario. The third scenario is a, a bit more complex. Uh, during our reconnaissance of the runner uh, environment, we noticed that each run command, we have two of these here, 
Each one of these, before it's been executed, it's also is saved on the file system as a shell file. And the runner saves it and then uh, executes it. So why it is interesting? Because in our case, we're, as an attacker, we have code execution at this point. We didn't receive the second command yet, so we have only this single run command. You could see here, as, a, as we're printing the directory, the runner temp directory, which saves this shell file, we have a single shell file that contains the same content as this one, but instead of the curly brackets placeholders, we have the real values which were inserted uh, as the action triggered. So if we we'll get uh, this second run comment somehow, it contains also this secret, the secret bot token, which will be placed as a, as a, a real value, which you, as an attacker uh, want to grab. So if we we'll get a foothold on this run command, we also get this bot token, this secret. But as I explained, the attacker have code ex execution at this point. So how can we fetch the, the next one that hasn't been executed yet? We have many methods to do that. A simple method that I had thought of was uh, just putting uh, some persistent script on the runner. Uh, what does it mean? It means a simple, uh, uh, you know, our case was Python script that was monitoring this uh, directory. And whenever a new shell file is written to the directory, this file would be immediately sent to some control server. As in me, as I'm simulating an attacker, so I created a server, and whenever a new file will be there, it will be sent to me. So uh, what will be the steps? Creating uh, some server that records all the all requests, creating some Python script that records modified shell script in that uh, directory, I packaged it all into some Docker container to ease the deployment, and I ran that container on the runner in a detached mode, uh, mapping the volume and, uh, and indicating the URL which you would send the file to. Uh, we'll so soon see in demo how it works altogether. So these were the three scenarios we show how to fetch secrets, but there are many, many more. They were really simple. And more sophisticated attackers will apply sophisticated methods, uh, which we won't include in this, uh, in this slide or in the article. Additional methods could be uh, inspecting the, the memory layout of the process inside the runner, try to extract some in sensitive information from within the memory. It could be uh, monitoring the created processes and maybe the secrets were sent through environment variables to the processes so we can uh, fetch maybe interesting information there. And there are many, many more methods for further uh, research. So let's start with the demos. Uh, for the first demo, we'll show how can we exfiltrate secrets. We will do it uh, in two steps. The first step, we'll just send our simple uh, GitHub token, as we explained, through the environment variable. And the second uh, phase of exfiltration will put some persistent script on the machine and wait for the second command that will be sent uh, also to our server. So, let's see. First, we set up the server, the R control server, and we're sending the malicious uh, issue to the repository. Uh, this issue contains several commands. If first, it will uh, uh, call the GitHub token. Uh, which is the first phase, and the second one will run the, the Docker run. As you can see, we got already the first token, which were uh, very simple through the environment variable. And, and we got also the second phase with the exfiltration. You could see we have here, I don't know if you remember, but we have here the complete script that was the third step for the, in the sample uh, workflow. We have the complete, uh, complete uh, bash script, including the uh, token contained in that script. So actually, we managed to get it. So for the second uh, demo, we'll show how we're able to commit malicious code into the repository without uh, the knowing of the maintainer of that repository. Uh, for that, we have we provided a really simple uh, a bash script that contains, uh, uh, that receives two parameters. The first one is the uh, the file that we want to commit is a URL from where we're fetching that file. And the second parameter is uh, the path in the, in the Git directory where we want to commit the file to. It's a really simple script. It fetches the file. 
and uh, does uh, some several Git commands like uh, adding the file, configuring the, uh, the, co the committer. We can put here whatever we want. We, even, we can imperson impersonate other committers. And then we commit it and uh, push the code. So on the runner side, we just, we will uh, uh, fetch the script and run it with some uh, uh, simple malicious file we simulated. So let's see that in action. You can see a, a, a demo repository with a directory and a file. Then we'll, we are adding a new issue. This issue, as previously shown, contains several commands. First, it fetches the script which, uh, which we saw previously. It gives us uh, the proper permissions uh, to run on the runner, and then it runs it with the malicious file, uh, some, some simple file. Uh, so we, we are going back to the repository. We can see we have additional file added to the repository. You, also, you could also uh, notice that the latest commit was made by maintainer name with innocent commit message. We have complete control over this data. Uh, the, fir the third demo will be a bit more complex. We are showing an additional concept uh, for, a, for attack vector. Uh, up to, to this point, we show that we are uh, exfiltrating secrets that were in that specific workflow. But uh, there are additional secrets that could be defined that weren't used in that workflow. There could, there could be secrets defined on the repository level, on organization level. They could be used in other workflows, not specifically that one. And maybe we have some method to fetch them as well. How can we do that? We show that we have the ability to commit to the, to the repository. So let's commit a new workflow that all he's, all, all he's doing will be to exfiltrate all possible secrets that he is exposed to. So how will we do it? We'll define this, uh, this workflow that, uh, that all it does is, is uh, taking all the secrets he's supposed to, uh, writing it to that secrets file, and uh, run a CURL to our some control server. But we have some minor issue because we need to trigger this workflow somehow from within our, our runner. Uh, GitHub has some, uh, it's not security mitigation, but they're denying the, the activation of workflows within other workflows. It's to deny a circular uh, triggering. So we are, uh, come with the idea, we, we're using workflow run, which tells this workflow to run after another workflow that called vuln will be will be finished uh, running. And this is the one that we injected in the first place. So we are injected this, uh, a workflow and uh, committing an additional one. And when this one is over, the one we created will be triggered automatically by GitHub. So this solves us our issue. And also on the, on the runner side, we're just going to run this simple command invoking GitHub API. Uh, this uh, command contains the, uh, the commit message, the email, the content. Uh, this content will be this workflow base64 encoded. And we're uh, uh, telling the path in which we want to commit this file to. So let's see how this works. First, we're setting the server, of course. Now we're running the malicious issue command. It's quite long because it has, has the complete workflow as a base64 base uh, data. And it, uh, as we said, running CURL command with put, um, with using the GitHub token, which we, as an attacker, previously fetched to, to invoke GitHub API. We're using the contents API of GitHub and adding the path of the file together with the commit message, committer, the email, and uh, everything. So let's see what we have received in our server. We received the, the bot token, which we previously get in our uh, first demo from, that, uh, for, from the second run command. We received a GitHub token for that specific uh, repository, for the, for the specific run. And we also got uh, two additional 
secrets that could be either defined in a repository level, used for other workflows, or in organization level, and uh, uh, this is additional tokens, could be additional sensitive assets, could be AWS tokens, could be Azure tokens, and et cetera. This is pretty cool. So uh, now we show possible attacks and exploitation. Let's see how can we mitigate it. The first uh, mitigation is to avoid, uh, avoid any run steps possible. Uh, for example, instead of using this uh, command that is susceptible to injection attack, we could use an external action that's called labeler that does exactly the same as this uh, command. It also received the title, but it's not susceptible to injection. Uh, this is not always possible, but whenever possible, it's really recommended uh, to do that. Uh, the second uh, method to mitigate this is to sanitizing the input, which is the, probably the most effective method to mitigate this specific attack. Is instead of uh, using the curly brackets inside the run, you just define them outside in the environment variable and use that variable inside the inside the command. Uh, this is this the, this mitigation exactly as Wire did, as Ilya showed previously, is very effective because we have uh, the trunk command just simple bash script which does this sanitation uh, uh, for us. Another uh, method uh, for a, a post-exploitation mitigation is to limit uh, token permissions. We can add inside the workflow this permission tag that will define the maximum uh, level of permissions that the GitHub token will receive. Uh, so uh, even if we'll, the attacker managed to uh, uh, to exploit and run code on our build, you won't be able to do whatever you want because it will, it will be limited. For example, in our case, we, have a, we need only read permissions for contents, we need to clone the code, and we need write permission to issue because we need to update a label, so this will be sufficient for our uh, sample workflow. A, another method that's uh, effective for the third a demo that we showed is to limit secret, secret exposure. Every secret defined, secret defined at the organization level could be defined uh, for what repository it could be exposed to. So even if an attacker would be able to, uh, to expose, to, to exfiltrate every secret possible, you won't be able uh, uh, if this mitigation will be applied. Um, and I, another minor mitigation will be to require approval for outside collaborator, collaborators. It's uh, additional uh, mitigation by GitHub. Uh, the default parameter is to require approval for first-time contributors. Uh, it mainly applies for public repositories. It should, if a contributor haven't committed code yet to the repository, it should be allowed uh, manually by maintainers to run his code. And the last one will be to use environment and branch protections. It's a second. Yeah. Uh, it's a, a rather new uh, mitigation by GitHub that uh, uh, only enterprises, uh, GitHub Enterprise allows it, that uh, gives you the ability to define secrets on environment level. Uh, so what will be the takeaway from this talk? Uh, first of all, uh, even when GitHub does m most of the security for you, for example, it gives you a GitHub hosted uh, runners, it gives you ephemeral environments, it gives you VM based isolation, etc. We are wanted to, to understand that your build uh, pipeline still could be compromised, and you should, uh, you should know that. The second one is as we've seen in GitHub uh, best practices. It does most of it does some of the, the, the it delegates uh, some of the security to the developer. I'm myself a developer, and I know that developers do make mistakes, so this should be handled uh, carefully. The third one is the the consequences that we've seen in the demo of such build compromise could be uh, really disastrous. Could be it could cause potential supply chain attack for that uh, vendor. It could attack many many clients. And the, the last one is that securing a pipeline isn't a matter of faith. In, we are showed that GitHub as an example, it supplies many security mitigations that 
uh, all could be applied. And uh, we warmly suggest you to, to use this as well. And uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. You are welcome to check the full uh, technical blog in the PsyCode blog. And uh, thank you very much, b sites for uh, hosting us here. A really great conference. Uh, that's it. A question? Thank you, Alex and Ilya. Do we have any uh, questions at this time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, there we go. Hey, so, yeah, just one thing came to my mind that what, what options do you have to check for attacks happened in the past? Like, uh, does GitHub do any logging? Or you just search for, fa uh, like, tickets with very strange names or, like, whatever do you You're have? asking how to check if you were attacked? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, GitHub doesn't support many editing. It has some, but it's not uh, very verbose and... Uh, uh, this entire like ecosystem of CI/CD security—it's really uh, the, uh, hasn't developed yet like other uh, standard uh, security uh, industry. So there isn't much uh, of you to 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 know that. But that's why we want to suggest like to to mitigate it from the start, not to allow it in the first place. And and of course for big organizations, this is exactly what our company does. It monitors automatically your commits, your pull requests looks for uh, vulnerabilities such as this one and alerts the maintainers automatically. Uh, anybody else at this time? Okay, one more. Hello, uh, so my question is, why the hell is GitHub not sanitizing these uh, like input fields? Like, it should be, shouldn't they? Yeah, this is a trivial question. Uh, we, I was waiting for that. Um, <laughs> no, I, I had this talk several times. And You're welcome. They're, they're all asking it. Uh, because they actually, they can't. I mean, they're allowing you to, it's code execution as a service. <laughs> they can't do that. Uh, it's not really possible. They're allowing you to run bash script. They, they can't do that for you. Thank but, you. But, but, but they can do other various stuff, like uh, warning you, like uh, telling you some, alerting you or something, like, and they do, don't do that, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> just, just as a note, yeah. uh, it's, it started like very raw, and people were starting to um, approve pull requests from inside workflows, so they added configuration, whether you can or can't approve uh, pull requests from workflows. And then the open source uh, tools where people just were running uh, uh, the, the fork the pull request, just were running and using the token, and then they understood there's a problem and added this mitigation to, for the maintainer to manually approve one, and then to manually approve everyone. So as, as you can see, they learn, uh, they, they step up their security posture on the GitHub Actions, but yeah, they can't do it like completely. Anybody else? No? In that case, Alex, Ilya, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.